Well, we got a great day today, and my privilege to make sure that you all are introduced to and know Caleb, Caleb Smith, one of our internships. As you heard already in the introduction, that one of the things we want to do is always want to be raising up and training up and equipping disciples to be able to make disciples. And so within that, we've got an internship program, and Caleb is one of our interns. So this is the first message that he's going to preach here at Grace. And so we want to just pray over him and uh, for that. And we are grateful just to see the work that uh, God is doing in you, the joy in the Lord that you bring, the encouragement and excitement that you bring. And we're very grateful for you. So let me pray over you. Father, I just want to thank you just for, first of all, for this young man, Caleb, and just again, how you have have saved him, how you are growing him, and how you are uh, drawing him more and more in love with you as he sees and beholds you for who you really are in all your truth and all your glory in the person face of Jesus. And so, Lord, uh, we pray for him, even as he preaches this message to us, Lord, uh, from Proverbs chapter 3, that, Lord, it would be a, a time of worship for his own heart, that the truths that he speaks would just resonate with his mind and heart as much as they do ours. And that it would be a time of just joy in you and the truths that uh, he gets to revel in and just asks, invites us into that worship with him. And so, Lord, prepare our hearts. Help us to have our hearts softened, ears to hear what you would say to us, even through Caleb, through this word. Um, Lord, prepare us to really hear what you want us to hear. Um, Soften our hearts, because if you bring it to us, it's you who want our good, and you want our very best, and so we need you now. Lord, we need help overcoming, as has already been prayed, uh, our pride and our weakness and all the things that we, we deal with and battle with, Lord. But we're glad that you know us fully, and you know our weaknesses, you know who we are, and you are both able, as James has already prayed, and willing to give us the truth. And let it cut us where it needs to cut, and let it heal us where we need that healing. So speak to us, Lord, now. We know you're with us, and be with Caleb now as he uh, proclaims your word to us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Awesome. Thanks, Murray. I really appreciate it. Uh, Good morning, Grace Fellowship. As Murray just said, my name is Caleb. And uh, yeah, I guess my mother-in-law, Melissa, already called out some people uh, this morning. So I'm going to, my call out to you guys is going to be, I'm going to need some more Kurtz, uh, just some more interaction. (laughs) And uh, yeah, no, but I'm really excited to be here. Um, And my name is Caleb. I've been an intern uh, for almost one year uh, this month. Uh, And so it's really cool to see the cycle of that. And um, it's just been an, an awesome experience to be a part of Grace Fellowship. Um, I'm a part of a community group uh, named Junction. And, uh, okay, well, <laughs> interaction, it's all right. We'll work on it, we'll work on it. But yeah, I've been a part of a Junction group for two, two and a half years. And uh, um, yeah, some of the biggest growth in my walk has been just meeting with those people on a weekly basis. And so I'm really thankful for you guys. It's partially some of your guys' fault that I'm here, so... <laughs> Um, and yeah, as I want to say, uh, it's an honor to be here this morning preaching in front of you guys. Uh, it's been a while since I've been able to open up the word in front of a congregation uh, like this. And I'm just really thankful for the opportunity for Murray as our elder and uh, the leadership team here as well for being willing to disciple with me and uh, work through that. And um, yeah, serving this church in this way is such a unique opportunity. And I don't want to let that be a small thing. It's, a, it's a quite a large ask. So um, thanks, guys. Um, So yeah, so today we're going to be continuing our trip through Proverbs. Uh, I believe this is week three, and specifically today we're going to be looking at Proverbs 3, 1 through 7. So if you want to open your Bible there, we're going to read it in a little bit here, but just to get you guys ready for that. Um, And yeah, as we open up our Bibles, I want you guys guys to remember um, that our King Jesus has your best interest in mind. Um, These words here in our text today, uh, they'll help us remember that ultimately, the wisdom of Jesus has brought rest for our hearts and and salvation for our souls. Um, No matter where you guys have come from this morning, you can remember that God gave you his son, Jesus. Um, No longer do you need to rely on yourself for you have been given a king to follow. As I have come to study my passage in Proverbs, um, this book was not just written to give you simple life advice. God didn't inspire this King Solomon guy to write a book of advice just so that you'll have a better life. No way. This book points us to something deeper. 
the book of Proverbs tells us something about ourselves and about the condition of our hearts. King Solomon was as much the author of this book as he was the recipient of this book as well. Solomon had his fair share of faults and sins that he was wrestling with. And we don't have the whole morning to take a deep dive into who Solomon was, but for us, we can know that this man was not Jesus. King Solomon and Jesus, they did have a few things in common though. They both experienced struggle, pain, temptation, and stress, and the pressure to make right decisions. But the difference between both of them, Solomon is trying to help save us from our foolishness, while King Jesus is trying to save us from our sin. As some of you may know, King Solomon is known to be one of the richest kings that ever lived, probably the richest one. In 1 Kings 10, oh, that's okay. And in 1 Kings, in 1 Kings 10, I'll go ahead and read it here. Uh, it's 1 Kings 10, 14 to 16. It says that, uh, just a little bit of background on how rich King Solomon was. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 666 talents of gold. Besides that, which came from the explorers, from the businesses of the merchants, and from all the kings of the West, and from the governors of the land, King Solomon made 200 large shields and beaten gold. 600 shekels of gold went into each shield. And to give you guys an idea, to put that into maybe a little bit more of a cultural context with numbers, King Solomon basically received 25 tons of gold per year, excluding the amount of income he made from merchants and people that would import. As you guys might know, gold currently is worth around $1,800 an ounce, and there's 32,000 ounces in one ton, and he received one ton yearly for a certain amount of time when he was in reign. Some people have said that King Solomon was the richest person to have ever lived with a total net worth of $2.1 trillion. To put this in perspective, Elon Musk is the richest person in the world at the moment, and he has roughly one-tenth of the amount of wealth that King Solomon would have had. So yeah, to say the least, Solomon was extremely wealthy. This king was also known for his wisdom. Um, in 1 Kings chapter three, God answers the prayer of Solomon and tells the young king that he is pleased with his request for wisdom and understanding. 1 Kings 3, seven through 12 says, "'And now, O Lord my God, "'you have made your servant king "'in place of David my father. Although I am little, I'm just a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you've chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil and for who is able to govern this great people of yours. It pleases the Lord that Solomon asked this, and God said to him, because you have asked this for wisdom and have not asked for yourself a long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but you have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. Behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind so that no one like you, yes, yeah, sorry, so that none like you has been before you and none like you shall arise after you. So there we see God granting the request of Solomon for wisdom. And Solomon asked for these things as he was handed over a massive kingdom right after the death of his father, David, when he was probably somewhere in his mid-20s. This is extremely wild to think about because as of April, I turned 25, so mid-20s. And if you ask Miranda, I can barely get our taxes done on time, let alone run a kingdom. It is an insane thing. And so for now... I just want to set the scene a little bit of our passage with you guys. If you are new to the Old Testament scriptures, so much happens that it can be quite challenging to try to remember all of it. Stories of war and God's deliverance, stories of disobedience followed by God's judgment of, or grace, stories where God reveals himself to his people and all they can do is fall on their faces in awe and wonder. The Old Testament is full of amazing stories where God showed up. But to be honest, there's not any events that happen in the book of Proverbs. There's no David slingshot moment. There's no body of water that gets split into two. And there's no flood that resets the earth. It's a book of wise sayings. So 
as we read through this series, think about how you're supposed to read this book. What is Jesus trying to tell you about himself? Ultimately, Jesus is wisdom, and we wouldn't even be able to recognize wisdom if we saw it, if it had not come inspired through Jesus in the first place. You see, Proverbs are written in a way that allows the story of the Bible to truly unfold and be discovered in it. If we take a step back, we can see the flow of Proverbs is seen through the outline of creation, fall, and redemption. You will also see that Proverbs tells us about how creation is supposed to be. God's original plan for how the world was originally supposed to function is laid out in this book. Yet, as we all know, the world has fallen, and as I said earlier, it is encrypted with sin. Yet, this is not how it will remain. Knowing the entire biblical story uh, will actually help you pro- be able to process Proverbs in a fruitful way. But thankfully, we have a father who we can trust and with our hearts to, te- to teach us the deep truths that we have here in Proverbs. Aren't you guys thankful for that? So when we read Proverbs, let's recognize that this book isn't meant to be read like a self-help advice book. The Proverbs are written so that you will read a few verses every single day and spend time soaking in their truth. And with that being said, let's read our passage here together, Proverbs 3, 1 through 7. And I'll start in verse 1 here. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commands. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so that you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean on your own understandings. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. And uh, yeah, let's jump right in. Growing up, my dad would often, very often, sit myself and my brother and my sister, my two brothers and my sisters down to share wisdom with us. Most of the time, he was often speaking to me because I needed it the most, of course. But nonetheless, my father shared much wisdom with his children. At the beginning of Proverbs, King Solomon does the exact same thing to his children. Hopefully your parents did this with you. In the first nine chapters of Proverbs, they're written to a younger audience. The wisdom laid out in these chapters can often be seen as short snippets of wisdom that will help you improve your life. But the Bible is, like I said earlier, is not just a book with good advice. It goes deeper than that. And it was never its goal when it was written. The goal of the Bible is to ultimately point us to Jesus and the heart that he has for his people. And here today in these seven verses, we will get to see how our hearts are made for trusting in Jesus. Now, to try and understand the first verse, we need to know why we need to hear wisdom in the first place and why it's even being given to us. I briefly shared a second ago that my father uh, would often sit down with my siblings and I to share wisdom with us. Why was that? Well, first off, humans of all ages are forgetful and need to be reminded of truth. No person is 100% spiritually good to go. And this is the reason that God put us in a family, a community of believers, because he knew we would need to be built up together in the gospel. This is reflected in how he gave us this church family and his spirit to do this for us. In verse one, Solomon writes, my son, don't forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commands. In this verse, Solomon is speaking to his son, and by extension, all of his sons or children, as, and also as some people have said, a boy's school for teaching, either or. In this verse, we can see that wisdom is something that is intentionally passed down. Wisdom desperately needs to be intentionally taught to the younger generations, as we can see in this passage, and King Solomon made it a priority to impart wisdom on these children. This is important to note 
because the intentionality here, this is how our heavenly father speaks to us when he reminds us of truth as his sons and daughters of the king. Jesus knows that our hearts waver and that we can't rely on our own personal wisdom alone. That's why we're here today. We need spiritual men and women to step up and teach wisdom to their peers, colleagues, children, and even the brother or sister sitting beside you here in church at Grace Fellowship today. I don't know about you guys, but my heart is in desperate need to be reminded of truth. In order not to forget truth, we must be reminded of what is true in the first place. The world around us is wanting to feed your mind and hearts with lies, confusion, distraction, and chaos. I like to think of what the world has to offer is like a buffet of food that has nothing good for you. Here today, as we sit and learn here together, we have been given the spirit of Jesus and the scriptures to help guide our hearts and minds down a path of trust in Jesus and the living truth of his word. I like to see this as a single meal that continuously nourishes. When we feast on wisdom, we nourish our hearts on the commands of Christ. Wisdom comes from Jesus, not us. Isn't that great news? This is why we can trust the verses we're gonna be reading here today. We know that we don't follow the words of King Solomon, but of King Jesus. And even if King Solomon is considered to be the wisest and richest man that ever lived, the latter, the later half of his life, it really didn't turn out so great. And even better, we can rest in the fact that we don't have to hide Solomon's shortcomings from the world. We already know that he is a human being, not God. And like I said earlier, we don't follow King Solomon, we follow King Jesus. As sinful humans, we need to expect humans to disappoint and fail. Thankfully, these Proverbs ultimately point us in the direction of Jesus, where our hearts were made to ultimately be. Verse two says, for length of days and years of life and peace, they will add to you. Verse two can often be misunderstood. The words in this verse would be considered something called a true principle and not an absolute truth. What do I mean? Well, when you read this proverb, do you see it as fully true? Are days in life always added to you when you keep God's commands? Well, no, not exactly. But in general, is this true? Yes. When we choose to live in obedience, in general, our lives will end up looking quite a bit closer to honoring Jesus than if we disobeyed. Living in obedience and honoring the Lord with your life will often help you find the path of peace, contentment, and joy. Think about this next statement with me. Work hard in school and you'll get a good job. Can you guarantee this? Have any of you experienced this? Well, no, this is not always true, but in general, I'd say it is true. Would we consider this, this statement to be an accurate and general rule for life? Yes. Most people that work extremely hard in school naturally end up getting a good job. Consider this next statement. Kindness goes a long way. In general, yes, I would also say this is true. Many of us could probably give examples or instances where either of these statements also didn't work, quite work out like they said they would. Sometimes hard work doesn't quite get you the high paying job you were expecting. And sometimes kindness doesn't really get you the reaction that you were hoping for. What I find interesting about both of these statements is that if someone you knew said either of these things, you would naturally fall on the side of agreeing with them. Not because you necessarily agree with the person or even think that they are a wise person for the general principles of life that they have shared with you, but because you know the statements they are making to be in general true. Before I move on, I wanna say one thing about both of these examples, about them being in general true in this life. But they are ultimately true for those who are on the path of pursuing wisdom. Wisdom leads to salvation and salvation will lead you to everlasting life. In this current life, generally true principles are only this way because of sin. When Jesus returns, these statements will ultimately be true because of the fullness of his kingdom is heaven here on earth. 
So in the fullness of time, these Proverbs are not just generally true for us who are followers of Jesus, but they will ultimately be true and experienced in fullness through the resurrection. So then it will be 100% worth it in the end. And then even not, if fully experienced right now in life, it will be then. Consider this. We have the God of the universe giving his children wisdom on the pages of this book. Our God, he doesn't lie to us. Our God does not mislead us. Our God has our best interest at heart. Ultimately, his best interest for us is true wisdom. Then this wisdom leads to our salvation. Our God doesn't mess around when it comes to guiding you. Going back to the idea about previously when I chatted about commands, I want to say one couple quick things. Nobody likes commands. You could probably leave it there. <laughs> In fact, we tend to put major guards around ourselves when we are given commands. Almost like we don't like being told what to do or how to live our lives. I know that's not just me. But would it be crazy to think that God created these commands for our benefit? And to even further this idea, to take the spotlight off of ourselves, what if God gave us these commands so that he would ultimately glorify it? I just think that's a huge point that we can't miss. I believe that this is the case for verse one and two and why they are tied together. Verse one gives us the idea that we are to actively remember and live in the commands of God. And verse two tells us the benefits of walking with Jesus. Our hearts were made to honor and lovingly follow the rules and commands that Jesus has laid out here before us. We find our delight and enjoyment in God when our hearts rest and delight in him. A few weeks back, Murray posed the question, and I just couldn't forget it as I was preparing this. And what he said was, who is more qualified to speak in your life than Jesus? What expert will you find or go to to match the God of the universe, to guide you in the challenges of life? God created these commands for our benefit. He created our hearts. He is the ultimate expert. I like to think of it this way. If you buy something and it breaks, you bring it back to the store you purchased it from in hoping that they can either fix it or give you a new one. If you truly believe that Jesus created and designed your heart, sin broke your heart, wouldn't you bring it back to Christ for repair? As we continue to read Proverbs, this will be a note that you will need to keep in the back of your mind. Our hearts are made to rest in Christ because he is the designer of our hearts. His commands are ultimately good news, and ultimately, his commands keep our hearts strong enough to, turn, uh, to endure the battle of faithfulness. Verse three and four reads, let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, so that you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. In verse three, there are a few words that I would like to quickly address. The first words being steadfast love and the second word, faithfulness. Firstly, the Hebrew word steadfast love translated by the ESV is hesed or hesed, however you say it. I think I'm close. Which means loyalty to a covenant that you agreed to or covenant love. This is the type of love that is seen in the lives of people who stay true to their marriage vows. Hesed means love in action. Steadfast love is really just a surface level definition for the word that deeply describes who God is for us. The second word, faithfulness, comes from the Hebrew word eme or emes, I think. <laughs> Somewhere in there. Google didn't really say it too well for me, so. The first definition of this word is dependability. When someone is dishonest or deceptive, we may refer to them as false. The opposite is reflected here in this verse. Eme is like our word, amen. This word carries other meanings such as reliability, accuracy, dependability, truth, and faithfulness. Throughout the follower of Jesus's life, we must know that these two words are really great news for our souls. 
the verse here tells us that we need to bind Heseh and Emet around our necks and write them on the tablet of our hearts. When I read this, I like to parallel the ideas of binding, of binding these words around our neck uh, to binding my smartwatch around my wrist. Whenever I look at my smartwatch, it reminds me to move and exercise. For some people, it's more of a shame versus guilt practice, but for me, it reminds me to exercise. Actually, Kurt would know because we have the same watch. But in order to be reminded, I have to wear it. I feel like the same is true with this verse. When you bind both of these words around you, they are able to serve you as a constant reminder to never forget about the steadfast love that we are loved by God through Jesus with a covenant love, a new covenant love where Jesus' love is confident and he is going nowhere as his faithfulness guarantees. In verse four, we see more of a benefit of life when choosing to walk alongside Jesus. As we can see here, your reputation, it does follow you. I know of men and women here in this church today that have found favor in the eyes of God and people. These people are all over the room today and I'm really blessed by them. In general, when you show steadfast love and faithfulness to the community around you, you will be shown favor. The the word favor in this context could also be translated as the word grace. Remember, Proverbs is reminding us about how the world works as God created it. When you hold on to loving faithfulness, your relationships around you will grow because you are dependable. The people you work with will begin to ask to come to you for advice and wisdom, and ultimately, God will be glorified because you are choosing to have his attributes surround your life. This is why we need to be gospeled on a daily basis. And the same idea applies to when I wear my smartwatch. In order to be, in order to be reminded and for, more, and for my watch to work, I have to be wearing it. Just like how we must remind ourselves of the truth of this book on a daily basis because our hearts are forgetful. In verses five through seven, as we have walked through these verses in my message here today, we have set ourselves up to understand that we have an immensely loving and patient father. This father is intentional, caring, and trustworthy. He is the designer of our hearts and deeply understands our flaws and our weaknesses. This God is so kind that he would give us a book like Proverbs so that we could learn about life from the one who designed life itself. Just imagine Elon Musk teaching you how to drive a Tesla. I know that there was a recall yesterday, so as long as you don't know that, we can just move on with this, but wouldn't that be an awesome experience? The insights and knowledge he would share with us would cause you to see the car differently. It understands its functions and the way it works in a more clear manner because he's the one who designed it. And we would be able to understand its functionality and the way it works and hopefully leading you to enjoy the car and the ownership experience in a greater way. This is exactly what the book of Proverbs does with our life. Verses five through seven says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways, know him and he will make your paths straight. Don't be wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. As an old biblical scholar by the name of Warren Wiersbe, he has an Old Testament name, I can't even pronounce it. He tells us, The word translated trust in verse five means to lie helplessly face down. It pictures a servant waiting for the master's command in readiness to obey. But it also depicts a defeated soldier yielding himself to the conquering general. I love this picture because it shows us the next level relationship we are to have with our heavenly father in reference to the defeated soldier yielding himself to the conquering general, there's a point where we must die to ourselves daily. Our hearts are wavering and misleading, causing us to fall helplessly face down in front of our king. Practically, practically, what does this look like? Well, first off, this means that trusting God and his wisdom for us, even when we disagree with where he is leading or what he is doing. Secondly, we must fight against the urge to think of ourselves as higher or wiser than Jesus, even when life doesn't make any sense in our view with our own eyes. 
Like I mentioned earlier, or like Murray mentioned, what expert will you run to or find or go to to match the God of the universe to guide you through the challenges of life? I'm not the expert. He is our creator and designer. This causes me to come to a point to realize that I'm so thankful for our sweet Lord. Amazingly, we have a father that doesn't turn us away in our misunderstandings. We have a Jesus that tells us to trust in his heart and not to follow our own wisdom. And that is rest for our souls. The moment I try to take on life by myself, mistakes are made and Jesus is not honored. Our hearts are made to trust in the Lord. He created us for this relationship and with him through his son, Jesus. The veil has been torn in two. And as sons and daughters of the king, Jesus is wisdom incarnate and we can run straight through the veil into his arms. Our king is worthy to be trusted. When the world tells you to trust yourself and dig deep in what is inside you, we reject that. We dig deep into our king who's created wisdom and understanding. We choose to trust an risen king, not a fallen man, which is who we are by nature. We dig deep into our Jesus, who has our best at interest at heart, because he created our hearts, and this is truly amazing. And ultimately, we trust in Jesus because his wisdom has led to our salvation, if you are in Jesus. A famous old minister by the name of Matthew Henry wrote that the treasures of wisdom are hidden not from us, but for us in Christ. Today, if you are sitting here as a follower of Jesus, my brother or sister, you have found the creator of wisdom. And this amazing wisdom has led to your salvation, just as like we were able to witness some people that have been baptized a few weeks ago. Jesus, in all of his glory and lordship, stepped down from the throne of heaven to straighten our paths as a wise king that he knew the world needed a savior. Verse six says, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will straighten your paths. Whenever I read this verse, I like to think and wonder to myself, doesn't God know that I already don't acknowledge him in everything I do? Doesn't he know that I will often wander off the path that he's prepared for me? The short answer is yes. Our father knows you, your motives, and your heart extremely well. Unlike us, God doesn't miss a thing. When God sees our hearts, he knows when we are trying to seek his wisdom and when we are not. The good news here is that the New Testament tells us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God doesn't ever reject us for our lack of trust in his wisdom. He pursues us in our weakness and gives us wisdom in the form of his son. This is why we trust in the Lord with all of our hearts. Our entire hearts are encrypted with sin. We need a heart that is good, moral, right, and perfect. A heart that bases its decisions off sound reason. A heart that has the highest standard of morality and virtue. A heart that is always right and exact with everything that it says or does. A heart that is without fault or flaw. This sounds like the heart of a king that I want to follow. Wouldn't you agree? Verse seven says, be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. In 1 Corinthians, Paul speaks in regards to the wisdom of Jesus and his cross as foolishness for fallen humanity. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is power of our God. This idea of atonement is not, sorry, not because of this idea of atonement is too difficult for people to understand, but because they lack the moral ability to see themselves in the world as God does. God knew we needed the book of Proverbs and our father knew then 2000 years ago and knows now what we struggle with. We aren't too much different when it comes to how our hearts operate from then to now. We are people that quickly forget God and are in constant need to be reminded of Jesus. Now that is why we are here today, 
to come together as a family to be reminded of truth, the condition of our hearts, and the promise of Jesus, and to stay focused on the day that Christ will return. As the overall theme of my message today, we must come back to the idea that God didn't create our hearts to rely on ourselves. God created our hearts to be in awe of what Jesus did for us and turn away from the foolishness that our, that our flesh craves. I recognize that it is a battle to die on a daily basis to ourselves. But being able to remember that my heart was made for Jesus reminds me of his love, and his love is what compels me to obey him as my father. Not too long ago in my message, I mentioned the whole thing about how I wear my smartwatch in order to be reminded to exercise. Well, there's something else I wear on my body every day that carries way more of meaning than just my watch. Can you guys guess what it is? Oh, Kurt. Free lunch, man. Free lunch. I was hoping Miranda would say it, but that's okay. I wear this. Sorry. I, uh, I wear this every day to be reminded Thanks, Kurt. That my life is no longer to be lived with only myself in mind. I have made a commitment to my wife, Miranda, to love her, cherish her, and carry her burdens just as she carries mine. I wear this to remember my commitment to her, but better yet is knowing that Miranda even loves me in the first place when I don't always fulfill this commitment. It is incredible that our wives continue to show us steadfast love and faithfulness through all the sin and brokenness that we come in with. How could I ever sin against such a gift of love? In Proverbs 3, 3, our text says that we are to bind love and faithfulness around our necks and write them on the tablet of our hearts. Again, giving, this, giving us this idea that we are to remember these two things so that we don't forget them. But the core problem here is not that I will forget to wear my wedding ring and forget that I'm married. I haven't done that. The core problem here is that I often forget that Miranda gave me this ring in the first place. Miranda put this ring on my finger, and despite all my flaws, she said, I do. Jesus did the same thing for us here in Proverbs 3, verse 3. It is Jesus that binds steadfast love and faithfulness around our necks and writes this on the tablet of our hearts, not us. This is the gospel of his love and the amazing grace that he has shown us. There are days when I will forget about these truths, but thank goodness I don't have to follow myself anymore. Who here does not like following themselves? Okay. Well, we'll talk after. <laughs> Panel Q&A. <laughs> um, there is something in the New Testament. I just want to share another idea. There's something, uh, there's somewhere in the New Testament that shares the same idea with us. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls with me. In other words, Jesus is saying, bind my yoke around your neck so that I can teach you wisdom. I know what sin you struggle with. I know how hard this next decision you have to make is. I know your weaknesses, what easily sways your heart. And even though you didn't obey me yesterday, remember how much I love you today and what it meant for me to go on the cross and die for you. Come to me, and you will find rest for your souls. To wrap up my time today, I want to encourage you, church, to go this week and live in the world, but don't be of the world. Choose the wisdom of God and pray that he shows you the foolishness of man so that you can truly turn away from it. The greatest news that you will hear today is that in Jesus, you've been given a new heart. A heart that was made to be given to Jesus so that his spirit can have full control over you, which is really good news when you know him. Do you remember in the beginning of my message where I talked about how my dad sat his children down to share wisdom with his kids? Well, this week, I urge you to sit down with your heavenly father. Open this book that we have been given and allow wisdom of our Father to speak and guide your life. As Christians, we must understand that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord, and you can rest in that. I'm going to pray for the time today. God, thank you for this word you've given us this morning. 
thank you for the opportunity to speak and um, even the opportunity for the early mornings and the late nights to be in your word and to be reminded of your truth. God, I just ask that, um, yeah, you use your words here in Proverbs and the rest of this series to continue to point us to Jesus, um, to, for us to continue to see this book and not just try to improve our lives, Father, but to remember that ultimately you improved our life when you came down from heaven and that you will resurrect us to be with you at some, at some point in the future. God, continue to bless the rest of our service today and uh, to remind us of your love and the great work that you did for us on the cross. In your name I pray, amen.